Up until now, we've been made to believe that people, specifically Targaryens, claimed dragons. However, the truth is just the opposite. It turns out that dragons claim humans. Dragons aren't dogs, they're intelligent creatures. It's like they adopt you instead of you adopting them. These creatures aren't like cows who are big enough but don't know their own strength. This begs the question, why did Sea Smoke claim Adam of Hull? Well, through the course of this video, we're going to answer that question, as well as dive into the grounds on which a dragon chooses their riders. Lastly, we'll talk about the fate of Lenor Valeria. Oh, and we have a small request before we get started. If you like the video, please consider subscribing to us. It might be a small click for you, but it helps us in marvelous ways to keep bringing you these marvelous videos. Now, let's get into it. Dragons are intelligent creatures who develop emotional bonds with their riders. Dragons are powerful, and they know it, so they wouldn't simply bow down to just any human who wants to ride them. Hell, even some Targaryens have issues bonding with dragons. Case in point, Rhaena Targaryen, who's been having issues since childhood in claiming. Even Aemond could not claim a dragon for the longest time, while others younger than him already had dragons of their own. Fortunately for us, there's enough evidence and knowledge about dragons that explains the strange behavior of our friend Sea Smoke, who became extremely restless after the disappearance of Laenor. He knew that Laenor wasn't dead, but he wasn't even around. In Gen Z terms, Laenor ghosted Sea Smoke. And on top of that, the two of them grew up together. But how does any of that help answer our question? Well, in Game of Thrones, Tyrion Lannister once said, and we quote, Dragons are intelligent, more intelligent than men according to some maesters. They have affections for their friends and fury for their enemies. This came in two centuries after the Dance of Dragons, but it holds true. Dragons can really identify a friend from foe and show behaviors such as problem solving, which puts them in a category of advanced animals comparable to humans. More importantly, they have some form of advanced senses, more like psychic skills, which allows them to judge the nature, character, and essence of humans around them. It may sound divine, but it's not. Even a skilled criminal psychologist can observe others and figure out what's going on in their minds, right? Then there's the emotions they reflect. Let's talk about Drogon, the one who was depicted the most on screen. When he started off, he was always close to Daenerys, his mother, and had a childlike curiosity when presented with food. When Daenerys apparently traded him off in exchange for the Unsullied, Drogon was visibly sad, almost as if he could understand what was going on. In all his interactions with the Mother of Dragons, Drogon showed how he could be dangerous to those who threatened his mother. Hell, do you remember the scene in which Jon Snow and Daenerys kissed in front of Drogon? Well, that was a sign of emotional intelligence. He knew that Daenerys was kissing Jon willfully, so he didn't do anything violent, but he stared long enough at the King in the North to scare him and tell him that if Jon broke her heart, he'd pay for it. In the end, when Jon did what he did, Drogon spared Jon, probably because he understood what his mother had become and saw reason in Jon's action. The point we're trying to make here is that dragons are intelligent enough to form an emotional bond with their riders and would naturally feel sad and restless if their rider went missing or died. So yeah, when Laenor disappeared for that long, Sea Smoke became restless and eventually realized that he needed a new rider. Does this mean Laenor died after his escape from Westeros, or does it mean Sea Smoke made his peace and moved on? We'll discuss this at length in a bit. Shared Bloodline Dragons can also decide who can be friends with them and who can't, so whether you're worthy of their friendship or not is pretty much decided by them. In the beginning, Drogon wasn't very happy with Jon, but as soon as he sensed the same lineage in Jon as Daenerys, he softened down a bit because, hey, Jon's family. Now, that also explains the way Sea Smoke behaves with Sir Stefan Darklin as compared to Adam of Hull. When Sir Stefan approached Sea Smoke, the dragon initially seemed rather calm and tolerant, but Stefan got too close and it became evident to Sea Smoke that the man wanted to claim him. After this realization, Sea Smoke's senses kicked in and he could see that Stefan wanted to claim Sea Smoke not out of respect for Sea Smoke's power, but out of hunger for Sea Smoke's power. Then there was a lack of strong Valyrian heritage, which was also missing in the case of Adam, but Adam had other factors worth, like being the half-brother of Laenor. So yeah, in order to bond with a dragon, you need to respect the dragon, not simply crave its power because it would make you powerful, and you also gotta have the proper heritage. This is exactly what King Viserys once noted when he said that the idea that we could control dragons is an illusion. They're a power man should never have trifled with, one that brought Valyria its doom. If we don't mind our own histories, it will do the same to us. All that the Targaryens have done is made the first fire-breathing beast to become accustomed to the presence of humans. They never really absolutely controlled or even fully domesticated dragons. 
So, a dragon doesn't settle for just about anyone, and we can rightly say the dragons claim their riders, often by cornering them in the woods, which is what Sea Smoke did when he claimed Adam. I mean, I'm sure Sea Smoke had his eyes set upon Adam for some time, and when the dragon became absolutely sure that Lenor was not returning, he went after Adam with all his might, and the lowborn man proved that he was worthy of being Sea Smoke's rider. What does Adam of Hull's actor have to say? So, Clinton Liberty, the man who plays Adam of Hull, has a few thoughts on why Sea Smoke claimed Adam. He believes that both Adam and Lenor are basically from the same family. He said in an interview to Variety, I feel like Sea Smoke, having been bonded with Lenor previously, senses that in Adam. But he also senses the kind of person who wants to achieve these amazing things in an honest way and not try and kill any. He senses the purity in Adam. While we ponder over what makes a dragon bond with its rider, Mr. Clinton believes it has a lot to do with the essence and decency of the rider. He notes that although Sir Stefan had the blood and a highborn status, dragons don't care about your social status, they do care about the essence of the human approaching them. Sir Stefan's personality and nature were not really what Sea Smoke was looking for. On the other hand, Adam and Lenor have similarities that go beyond the scope of blood. When you look at them as individuals, they are both just genuinely nice human beings. Now, this essence, this personality that we're talking about, it may very well be different for different dragons. Vermithor, who is called the Bronze Fury, needed someone as furious as himself. Hence, he bonded with Hugh Hammer, someone who's a brute force of a man and has a few anger issues. If we talk about Vagar, she was the ride of Queen Visenya, a strong, independent, and cunning woman. Likewise, Amond is not made up of roses and rainbows, he's all thorns and thunder. So yeah, that's a pretty important factor, the kind of person you are and how you're similar to previous riders. Adam reminds Sea Smoke of Lenor. So, in the second season's sixth episode, Sea Smoke flies over Spice Town, probably doing his regular dragony things. You know, going for an afternoon flight, finding food, that sort of thing. But here, Sea Smoke spotted Adam. Maybe Sea Smoke was specifically looking for Adam, who knows? But next thing we know, he charged towards Adam, soaring him into the woods before bonding with him. For a long time now, Adam has been evolving into a guy who wants authority, probably as a way to connect with his family, his father, and House Valerian as a whole. Having said that, there's no vice in this man. Likewise, Lenor was also very attached to his house and his family, as he had a quest to prove himself. When Lenor abruptly disappeared, Sea Smoke became lonely, something which Masaria also pointed out. Rhaenyra said that Sea Smoke and Lenor would travel to Spice Town, and although Lenor was no longer here, Sea Smoke continued with the habit. I believe Sea Smoke would visit Spice Town every once in a while to look for food or in Lenor's memory, but this time around, he was in Spice Town for something entirely different. This time around, he wanted to get himself a rider. Sea Smoke must have been sure of the many similarities that Lenor and Adam had. Of course, they are both sons of Corlys Valerian, the Sea Snake, but more importantly, both of them wanted to serve their house and father. Hell, Lenor even married Rhaenyra for the sake of his house. Similarly, throughout House of the Dragon, Adam has tried to convince his brother Alan to feel happy about the interest that Corlys was taking in. Even in the future, Adam would do everything in his command to serve the queen that his father owes his fealty. The two words, well done, coming from Corlys, probably gave him more happiness than being able to ride the dragon because finally, finally, Corlys is proud of it. Do you wait for the dragon to come to you? One tiny observation we couldn't shrug off is that with all three dragons that were claimed, it seems that you let the dragon come to you instead of getting close to the dragon and making the move. It's like crouching down, holding out your hand, and waiting for a cat to come and see you, but that's a bit subjective. We all have our different ways. A better analogy might be that of a hippogriff named Buckbeak from Harry Potter. You see, there, Hagrid instructs his students to allow the hippogriff to come to them instead of getting too close. Of course, Malfoy doesn't listen and pays the price. Likewise, Sea Smoke, Vermithor, and Silverwing, all of them were claimed only by riders who let them make the move. Sir Stefan got too close and paid the price. Hugh Hammer confronted the dragon and showed strength and valor in protecting the other dragon seed from Vermithor, but in the end, he just stood there and waited for Vermithor to analyze him and calm down. Once Vermithor calmed down, he came closer to Hugh, which was a sign for Hugh to take the final steps and touch the second largest dragon in all of Westeros. Is Lenor Valerian dead? 
The bond between Adam and Sea Smoke raises some intriguing questions, especially considering Adam's Galarian heritage and ambitious streak. Sea Smoke suddenly taking a liking to Adam is puzzling, since dragons, according to George R. R. Martin's lore, are fiercely loyal to their riders as long as they live. Here's where things get spicy. If Sea Smoke has gotten Adam as a new rider, that might hint at something major. Lenor could be dead. Dragons won't just switch loyalties unless their original rider has passed away. Adam, with his legitimate Valerian blood and respect for dragons, is a natural choice. He even wisely booked it when Sea Smoke first approached, an act of respect rather than greed, unlike Sir Stefan's brash attempt. Rhaenyra's conversation with Missaria about Sea Smoke's odd behavior sheds some light on the situation. Rhaenyra thinks the dragon's restlessness is due to war tensions, but Missaria suggests it might be loneliness, which could imply that Laenor, who left Westeros for adventures in Essos with his lover, might have met his end. There's no telling what Laenor encountered out there, but it is possible he's no longer alive, leading Sea Smoke to seek out a new companion from his bloodline. What happens to Adam and Sea Smoke in the book? After Adam Valerian made a name for himself by mastering the dragon Sea Smoke, his fortunes took a significant turn. Lord Corliss Valerian, seeing his valor, approached Queen Rhaenyra Targaryen with the request to officially recognize Adam and his brother Alan as true Valerians, stripping away the stigma of their illegitimate birth. Rhaenyra agreed and elevated Adam from the status of a dragon seed bastard to the legitimate heir of Driftmark just in time for the Battle of the Gullet. When Rhaenyra's forces took King's Landing, the city saw the formidable dragons and their riders take over the Red Keep. Prince Daemon Targaryen, after ensuring the city's safety, signaled his wife to join him. Although Daemon has been at Harrenhal making a fool out of himself, he might join Rhaenyra in Episode 8. Just in case you couldn't tell, this script was penned right after Episode 7, so... Anyways, later in the book, Adam kept Sea Smoke soaring above the city walls. With Rhaenyra deciding to hold court in King's Landing, Adam and his dragon Sea Smoke, along with Prince Joffrey Valerian, remained to help secure the city. While Rhaenyra kept her dragon Cyrax close, Sea Smoke and the others were stationed at the Dragon Pit. It was customary to have at least one dragon rider on guard there, ready to defend the city at a moment's notice. With the Queen preferring Cyrax's immediate presence, that responsibility fell to Sir Adam Valeria, who now stood as one of the most important defenders of the city. After the betrayal at the First Battle of Tumbleton, trust was running thin within the Black Council and fingers were pointed at Adam. Despite Lord Corliss, the Queen's Hand, vouching for Adam's loyalty, claiming he and his brother Alan were true Valerians, Queen Rhaenyra was unconvinced. She ordered Sir Luther Largent to seize Adam in the Dragon Pit. Luckily, Adam was tipped off and made his escape on Sea Smoke, flying quickly out of reach. This cost the Queen not only a valuable dragon rider, but also her hand, as Corliss faced imprisonment for his part in Adam's escape. Determined to clear his name, Adam didn't flee, and instead he went on a mission. Legend has it he landed on the mystical Isle of Faces, where he sought wisdom from the Green Men. Meanwhile, he rallied an army, sweeping through the lands and gathering nearly 4,000 men ready to follow him into battle at Tumbleton. The Second Battle of Tumbleton started under the cover of darkness. Catching the Greens completely off guard, Adam swooped in with Sea Smoke and took advantage of the chaos. With enemy dragon riders Hugh Hammer and Prince Daeron already dead, unbeknownst to him, he spotted the dragons Vermithor, Silverwing, and the riderless Tesserion taking to the skies. As Vermithor began his rampage, Sea Smoke intervened and dove at the older dragon, driving him into the muddy battlefield. Then, Tesserion joined the fray, which led to a deadly dance of dragon against dragon. Sadly, all three dragons clashed in a ferocious battle that left no survivors alive among them. Because of his valiant efforts and the ultimate sacrifice of his life, Adam's heroics turned the tide of the battle. Lord Unwin Peak, facing defeat, was forced to retreat with what was left of the once mighty host. Adam, once branded a potential traitor, proved his loyalty to King's Landing and Rhaenyra's cause, which is why he's still a true hero of the realm. Long live Adam of Hull. Unfortunately, that's all we got for you this time, but if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. This is Wheezy249 for Marvelous Videos, signing off. Thanks for watching, stay safe out there, and have a marvelous day.